how often do you think about your own mortality? Every day. And one, are you afraid of it, the uncertainty of it? And what do you think happens after you die? Sure, I'm afraid of it. I mean, because it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's next. I mean, I, I, I can't know it the way I know you. So of course I'm afraid of it. And I think of it every day. Um, that's true. Uh, my prayer life uh, compels me. You know, we have this, the, um, the Hail Mary prayer. You know, so you pray the rosary. Uh, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Now and at the hour of our death, amen. Now at the hour of our death, amen. You pray the whole rosary 50 times. You reminded yourself of your own death. Uh, but I do. I think about it because it's the ultimate limit. It's why it's it's beguiled every artist and writer and philosopher. It's the ultimate limit, you know, question. But yeah, sure. I, I'm afraid of it because it's, it's the unknown. Uh, what do I think happens? I think I'm drawn into the deeper embrace of God's love. You know, and that's stating it kind of in a in a more poetic way. Um, do you know John Polkinghorne's work? Do you know that name? Mm-hmm. John Polkinghorne was a very interesting. He just died recently. He was a Cambridge University particle physicist, right? High high level scientist, who at midlife became an Anglican priest. He left his job at Cambridge and went to the seminary and became an Anglican priest, right? And then wrote, I think, some of the best stuff on science and religion because he really knew the science from the inside. Here's Polkinghorne's account that I've always found persuasive. He said, what, what survives after we die? So the, this body clearly dies and goes into the ground or it's burned up or it goes away, right? But what's preserved? And he says what Aristotle would have called the form, Polkinghorne calls it the, the pattern. So the, the pattern that's organized, the, the matter that's made me up over all these years, that's obviously not the same as it was even, I mean, you would know how, how often does it all change, all your atoms and cells and, you know. In other words, the, the little, you know, Bobby Barron who was growing up in Birmingham, Michigan, there, I can have a picture of him, and then there's me, and I say, oh, that's, that's the same person. Well, I mean, clearly not materially speaking, not at all. It's completely different. But there's, there's a unity to whatever that pattern is by which all of that materiality has been kind of organized, you know. So Paul Cameron says, I think that pattern is remembered by God. And remember, it's the wrong word, as though it's like derivative. I mean, it, it's known by God. And so God can therefore re-embody me according to that pattern at a higher pitch, what we call the resurrected body. Uh, so Paul talks about a spiritual body. It's body, for sure, I mean, because he believes in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, but it's not a body like ours from this world. It's a, it's a body at a higher pitch. So something... Some pattern that's there persists. The pattern persists in the mind of God and then is used as the ground of the re-embodiment of me. So it's not like I'm, I've just become a Platonic form. I'm going to be re-embodied because the Christian hope is not for Platonic escape of soul from matter. That's never the Christian hope. It's for the resurrection of the body, we say. And you say, what a fantastic idea. Well, I don't know. I mean, th- this body is being reconstituted all the time according to this pattern, right? It's not the same matter. And so might there be an, another sort of higher material that is organized according to the same pattern, which has been remembered by God? So therefore, we can hang on to the language of body and soul, if you want, or matter and form. But it's the form remembered by God and then reconstituted in an embodied way by God that we call heaven, the heavenly state. That's what I hope for. That's my Christian faith, my Christian hope. Let me ask you about the big question of of meaning. Uh, we've talked about it in different directions, uh, from different perspectives. What's the meaning of our existence here on earth? What's the, the meaning of life? Love. God is love. And the purpose of my life is to become God's friend. And that means I'm more conformed to love. And so my life finds meaning in the measure that I become more on fire with the divine love. I'm like the burning bush, is to, is to become more and more radiant with the presence of God. That's what gives life meaning. To, to, meaning is, is to live in a purposive relationship to a value, I would say. So there's all kinds of values, as I say, moral, aesthetic, intellectual values. And when I have a purposive relationship, like so right now you and I, we have a purposive relationship to the value of, let's say, you know, finding out the truth of things, and, and we're speaking together to seek that. Well, good. 
what's the ultimate value? The value of values is God, the supreme good, right? The supremely knowable, the supremely intelligible is God. And so to be conformed to God is to have a fully meaningful life. And who's God? God is love. So that, that's where I would fit the package together that way. You're um, adding a lot of love to this world, and which is something I deeply appreciate, and that you would sit down with me, um, given how valuable your time is, is a huge honor. Thank well, you so much for talking Well, my great pleasure. I loved it, Lex. Thank you.